We're going to scroll back now more than four decades and look at a slice of history, filmmaking in South Africa during the era of apartheid. Like many governments, South Africa has offered subsidies to the film industry. And the subsidy we're looking at was known as the B scheme, an alternative to the A scheme that already existed. In order to qualify for the B scheme, filmmakers who were mostly white back then had to produce films with black casts for black audiences in a black South African language, such as Zulu, Hossa, or Tswana. From around 1973 to 1989, as many as 1,500 of those films were produced. But in many cases, there was a prevailing theme, a larger message, one that would explain why the apartheid government, with its policies of racism, oppression, and segregation, would help bankroll movies that were made ostensibly for the entertainment of black South Africans. The Listening Post's Nick Muirhead now on the B-Scheme subsidy and the effect that it had on filmmaking in apartheid-era South Africa. This is the Ayetu Cinema in Soweto, the first black-owned cinema in South Africa. It's boarded up and abandoned now, but during the struggle against apartheid, it was a focal point, a place where subversive films were shown and activists could organize. On January 1st, 1973, it made cinematic history in South Africa by being the first cinema to screen a film called Joe Bullet. What made it groundbreaking? Joe Bullet was black. Who's this? I'll kill that bastard with my bare hands. When Joe Bullet came out, we were excited uh, seeing a black action movie in the townships, and the, the all black cast. So we really liked it. It put more people in our cinemas. It was quite unique for the time, just because at the height of apartheid, no one was really considering producing movies with all black cast members for black audiences. Joe Bullet is a kind of very suave ladies man coming to the rescue of, of both damsels in distress as well as you know those who hire his uh, investigative and, and, and martial arts expertise. A black character who's your James Bond-esque kind of guy. They want us to join the Falcons so they can win the cup final. And you want me to keep them off your backs? Living in a, in a nice apartment, driving a nice car. He's got all these sorts of things which the government didn't obviously want the majority of the population to kind of aspire to. The writer and producer of Joe Bullet, Tony van der Merwe, says that they premiered the film without approval from the apartheid censors and that just two screenings later, it was banned. They say that he's uh, taking the law in his own hands, he's carrying a gun, drives a sports car, stays in a, clearly in a white area, stupid, stupid reasons for banning it. <laughs> Fundamava says that the decision to ban Joe Bullet was eventually overturned, but by then it had lost its momentum and would never recover. While the film was ultimately a commercial failure, the response from black South African audiences convinced Fundamava and his fellow filmmakers that there was a huge demand in the country for this kind of content. However, what they also knew was that without the apartheid government's approval, these kind of films would just keep on getting banned. So they had to make a deal. And there was already a template in place. Nearly two decades earlier, in 1956, the apartheid government had created a subsidy to help grow a national film industry for white South Africans. The films had to have white casts, dialogue in white South African languages, and typically they would promote the white South African way of life. If that criteria was met, the filmmakers would get money back based on ticket sales. They called it the A-Scheme Film Subsidy. Tony van der saw an opportunity. He lobbied for a B-Scheme Subsidy, films with black casts for black audiences in their own languages. And there's a reason why the apartheid government went along with it. The idea behind the, the subsidy itself was if we created a vehicle through which to entertain the masses, it would keep their minds off of political unrest. It was about moralizing the leisure time of black people. Because if they're not occupied, they get up to all kinds of mischief. And 
a secondary benefit, a plus, huge plus, was of course the, the kind of ideological value that the apartheid state could get out of it. You lose, Sonny. And the police will too have to have you. Kelly, the apartheid government saw the propagandistic value in the B-Scheme film subsidies. So were there any themes or storylines that the government would favour in these films? They would love you to put in um, the good will always win over the evil. So, so crime doesn't pay. <laughs> and another thing is they wanted to bring that idea uh, to the black people that you should go to your homeland and stay there. That's your place. Don't come to the white area. Homelands were small, semi-autonomous regions, typically underserviced and poverty-stricken, allocated to black South Africans in the apartheid era. And that theme that once your work is done in so-called white South Africa, you go back to the supposed tranquility of the homelands, was so prevalent in the B-Scheme films that the genre would come to be known as Back to the Homelands. <laughs> The urban centres were always portrayed as dens of vice for black people. And black people were portrayed as morally weak. They always succumbed to the evils of, of the urban centres. So uh, that's the, kind, the spin off on the Back to the Homelands. I don't necessarily ag agree with the notion that this, that they were purely uh, propaganda-driven kind of films. There were also a large amount of producers and filmmakers who were just making movies for the sake of making movies. And actually, we now had black camera operators, sound guys. There were the performers in front of cameras who were all black. <coughs> kind of do a blanket brush across it saying that that's what it was all about, I think is not a fair um, assessment of actually what happened. The filmmakers um, catered to what uh, they knew the censor board would approve of. They were acting as surrogates, in a sense, for the apartheid state. And one can understand that. I mean, I'm not saying that as a critique, necessarily, because one can understand. They lived the apartheid, you know, and they lived in a particular time when they knew how their world was bounded. And they stayed within the boundaries. Very few overstepped. And there was a huge financial incentive not to overstep. If their film did well, producers could expect up to a 600% return on their investment. If their film was banned, producers could lose their investment entirely. Like the A scheme, the success of a B scheme film and therefore the size of the subsidy it received was based on ticket sales. But at the time, there were only a handful of cinemas that allowed black audiences and certainly not enough to support the industry. So the B scheme filmmakers created their own distribution networks, mobile cinemas that they sent out to the townships and set up in schools, churches, open fields, anywhere they could screen a film. They enjoyed it. If, if a film unit turns up in a town, it was like, in my days, the circus coming to your town. Very excited. Everybody was excited, the kids were excited. And amazing, I think, because the films were shot mainly in Zulu, in their own mother tongue. We were so ignorant. We, we welcomed anything that came our way. It was movies for us, it was entertainment. We never saw anything wrong, because that's all we had. Our eyes only opened when, you know, more uh, Western movies were coming through. It's only then where we realized that this, it's not good for us. In the dying years of apartheid, the B-Scheme film subsidy was abolished, not least because filmmakers were inflating their ticket sales to increase their subsidies. Today, not much is known about it. Official documentation has mysteriously disappeared and so have many of the films, leaving opinion divided. Was the B-Scheme a blot on the South African film industry or did it pave the way for many black South Africans to enter it? Are the films propaganda or are they a lost heritage? By modern standards, the B-Scheme films haven't aged well, but look at the story behind them for the better picture of South Africa.